Hey guys, Puzzle Man 945 here. Um, happy Sun, happy Monday. Monday. It is Monday. Yes, it's Monday. Um, uh, this is part two of my top 15 TV shows. The only reason that I stopped at number four is because that video, part one, is an hour and 25 minutes which is way longer than any other video I've ever recorded. So, um, I just decided to kind of stop there for my, for, because I didn't have any break after that much recording, honestly. But continue where we left off. And number three is Star Wars, The Clone Wars. Now, um, I've talked about this show mostly when I re ranked and reviewed every Star Wars movie and TV show list. Um, uh, so, to be to be quite frank, I don't. I think I pretty much covered a lot of things about the show in that video. Um, but I really like it. <laughs> Um, I'm just gonna skip over that one, but uh, number two is, and this is another show that, yet again, I have not expressed my appreciation enough for how much I love it, and number two, and my favorite sitcom, and, like, the show that I think is, like, least likely for me to actually enjoy, um, The Golden Girls, um, for one, this show is the funniest show I've ever seen, like, there's so many, like, um, jokes about sex, and then other just really, really funny jokes about how, um, Rose is a complete nitwit, and then Sophia's, like, um, can't control what she's saying, and then Sophia makes all, not Sophia, Dorothy makes all these really sarcastic comments, and then Blanche is really, really into men, and there's a whole bunch of jokes about each one of them. And, um, also jokes about other hilarious characters, like Stan, um, yeah, okay. <laughs> I mostly can just think of Stan, but, like, whatever other character they introduce, and also end up being hilariously funny, and, um... It also has a great amount of character development, and like each character, like a lot of the episodes, theming is um, really, really funny. And um, really, the only uh, thing that I don't get is all the celebrity references. Um, uh, coming in at number one, though, is Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Um, I first watched this show in January of 2019, and after watching through the entire show, it is easily my favorite show ever. Um, it used to be originally five seasons, but then they came out with a sixth and then a seventh season. Um, and I'll go through, like, season by season, character by character, whatever. So, starting with season one, I think this season does a great job of introducing this, the, like, what S.H.I.E.L.D. does and what it does as an organization. Um, but also the collapse and how they, and how they gradually go from centipede into Hydra, I think is, it, it's so good, and to tell you stuff like Clairvoyant, and then eventually into Hydra, and like how they find out the Clairvoyant, like, I've never been more um, mystified by something in a, by a question in a TV show than who is the Clairvoyant, like, it, 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 even for a first season, it has so much scale to it, and I really have to give it a lot of credit for that. Um, just getting some basic things out of the way, this show has amazingly good action, and the CG is also really good. Um, 
but like the same thing I can say honestly about um, a lot of TV shows that are like that. And um, I also have to compliment the shots. The camera work is incredible on this show. Um, yeah, it's just some basic like, pauses out of the way. Um, the second season introduces the idea of Inhumans to the audience, where it's kind of very briefly explored in season one, because, um, it's like talking about, um, uh, Raina and how she thinks she's different, and talking about how Sky is different, um, and I think that's a really really good, good stuff, honestly, um, and then the third season had, kind of, um, introduces the aspect of Maveth, which, or Maveth, which is, like, a whole other planet, which is really, really bold, and I love it, um, I put Netflix on my TV and just like instinctively I just like keep staring over at the TV to see what they're doing. Uh, anyway. Um and then Hive is possibly um one of my favorite villains. I can't honestly remember if he made it into the villains list or not. Um but uh yeah, just the high, the way that high, that they wrote Hive, I feel like is um they did it incredibly because Hive is definitely one of the best villains I've ever seen and probably my favorite villain within the entire show. Um, No, I'm not going to lie, Garrett comes close. Because of the ultimate seduction of him being the clerk one in season one, and then eventually the Hydra agent that they believed, and then, like, um, turned on them. And it's really, really good stuff. Um... And just overall, like, um, yeah, in season four, I kind of felt like the beginnings of both season two and season four were a tiny bit just lackluster in some aspects because, um, uh, just because of the way that, um, It talks about, um, I don't know, it's just kind of slow, especially with the whole things, new stuff that gets introduced in season four with director Mace. But it definitely picks up in intrigue as the season goes on because it introduces the Ghost Rider, which is definitely one of the most interesting characters. Though, um, I, I've never really been behind the Watts Dogs. I think they're kind of cool, but. Um, not, not the best to me, until we get to the Anton Ivanov stuff, which is, like, later in the season, but that's, that's when, like, when it starts involving the Russians and not just these Americans, um, when, when it involves the Russians colliding with Sindrindir, that's when it gets interesting, that's when it gets really, really good, um, <sighs> At, now, however, near the end is definitely the best parts because the framework is honestly one of the most genius things that the writers of this show e e came up with as a whole. I mean, the idea of a whole alternate world where just everything is parallel is such a creative concept, and they managed to fit so many minute details.
into um, the framework that, like, it really is just an entire character study between different characters while, while during those, like, four or five saga framework episodes, um, which I really, really love. Um, and then, of course, I've got to give the best season to season five, and to be honest, I love that they made more seasons, but this should have been the last season, um, because it introduces Enoch as a chronicom, and it makes the chronicom seem, seem really uh, quirky and an interesting race that have been observing humanity for a really long time. And that's, that was a really creative idea that they went with um, regarding uh, Enoch and his character, and Rip Noah Chronicom, who got exploded by the undetonation of all the monoliths, which created the gaping void thing. Um... And, um, <clears throat> I have to say, um, the way that Phil Coulson's character develops in this, um, season is absolutely amazing. I love that the, I love the intense amount of character development that's involved with them trying to, um, keep him alive and whatever. Um, that type of thing just really makes me, um, I just love that stuff. Um, season six, um, this is where it really started to drop in quality, just because um, I'm, I don't, I'm not really into the whole Shrike thing. I never found that to be particularly interesting. Um, and also, between season six and seven, they did way too much with the Chronicoms. Like, I really feel like the writers just completely overdid the whole Chronicoms idea. And to be honest, it, it kind of makes... Um, season 7 a bit hard to watch sometimes, especially with the time travel thing, like, with that, I thought they were, I thought it was honestly a bit lazy, but I really have to kind of go against myself with that there by saying that, um, the, uh, the way that they the, like, the amount of creativity that they honestly put into each time era and the amount of personality that each era receives is um, really, really good. And I, I, I just love how much personality they, they put into um, like each season, which honestly like kind of counteracts what I say about the laziness of the time travel idea. But still, the transition between season six and seven makes almost no sense at all. Like they like I feel like that transition was done really poorly. Um and overall I just feel I just kind of felt like um season seven was kind of an un satisfying way to complete the show. However, your the last episode did manage to make up for that in some ways by having a pretty satisfying ending, but the season as a whole didn't really feel like a great way to close out. Um honestly. Um Moving on to characters, this is honestly going to take the bulk of this video, but, um, I think I want to start. I'll go season by season. So, um, starting with Phil Coulson, um, you see a little bit of him in the Avengers movies, but he's really explored here, and the main arc that he gets in season one is, is exploring just how he actually 
died and how it was hidden from him. And that process is really interesting. Um, and I love, absolutely love how they did that. And then it and then uh, it gets further into season two because he starts having his alien writing impulses, which in turn leads to the discovery of the city and then the introduction of humans in the second half of the season. Um, that arc is also really cool because it's kind of something that I don't think is tackled anywhere else in the show, but you see this kind of obsessive thing, which is really, really good stuff. Um, going into season, well, I mean, uh, between the whole, the whole of the show, um, Coulson has a complex relationship with Ward, who is a character I'll get to next, um, but, uh, Coulson and Ward, like, Ward eventually betrays because like turns out, oh, oh, he's like um, working with Garrett, really, but he wants to take the team. He only really makes Ward a really complex character, but I'll, I'll get to um, Ward next. I have my Coulson first. Um, Coulson is. Uh, Um, like, the way that they, in, especially in season three, build off his need, his, his desire for revenge, and how he has to have revenge against war, and especially that scene on Naveth, where he just completely caves his ribs in, how it kind of pays off in his dialogue in Tive. I really love the way that they wrote Coulson's character that way with such an obsessive desire for revenge and how he comments on himself going too far and um, if, it, if he hadn't killed Ward then Hive wouldn't have existed. So you know you get a really really good character dynamic present there honestly. Um and, of course, then in Season 5, you really see the depth of how, um, he, uh, is, um, just, like, he's just to the, he remembers, like, I don't want to die either, but if it's for the sake of the world, I'm just one person. And I really love that mentality that Coulson has throughout this entire season, because, um, I just think it's really good. <laughs> um, I might have a bit of time hard describing things sometimes, but I, I, I really do like me when I say when I like the stuff about it. Um, honestly, um, moving on, to, well, I mean, one thing. You can't talk about um, Coulson without talking about his relationship to Sky slash Daisy. For mostly sake, I'm just going to call it Daisy because that's what her name is for the majority of the season. So, um, Coulson and Daisy's relationship really develops over the course of the entire show because they become really really good friends who care about each other a lot and how and how um daisy is really the one that will do anything to keep colson alive because colson did so much for her and honestly the way that they really pay off the, the dialogue with that is incredible i love it to pieces um Moving on to Ward, um, he is um, mostly in the first three seasons, but he does get this special appearance in season four in the framework, which I'll talk about um, later on. But starting in season one, you know, he gets the typical shield agent, black Kevlar, like as he, as he calls it, like really kind of stiff about it. What's really interesting is when they start to open about world about Ward's backstory in um 
and how, like, he talks to Sky about it, and, um, and all that stuff, and, like, Though, and, like, his backstory really plays a, um, really influential role in how, um, he kind of views the world and how he kind of want he, and how a big thing of his is the idea of closure and how everything, and how he's dealt with his own problems, he's, he has closure with his demons, which I really think is, um, very consistent, and I really like how consistent they were in keeping just with that theme of, um, with the idea of closure and that moral behind Ward's character throughout the entire show. Of course, I already talked about Hive a little bit, but yeah. Um, moving into that thing that I talked about earlier with the framework, basically, he gets an appearance in the framework where um, basically everything got its flipped, so on flipped on its side. So, whereas he was a shield agent, but secretly for Hydra here, he's a member of Hydra, but also secretly a member of the Resistance, which is called Shield. Which, and especially in the way that, that they um like, especially in the in way that they use the dialogue, like because. In season one, it's like Garrett Sabi, and it's like Victoria Hand, who's like the top one of the top Shield agents in season one, and and I just think that the way that they kind of reverse the dialogue, like, really fits Ward's character, but also fits even better the theme of the framework of flipping everything around. And believe me, I was completely shocked to see Ward in the framework. That was a very pleasant surprise to me. Um, moving on, I, I, I guess I can discuss them both, because they're, they're a pretty significant duo, and also pretty significant characters otherwise, but Fitzsimmons, um, for one, they just have this, the best, like, um, romance relationship development, because they saw his friend, they start dating, they eventually get married, and then, and then, then they have a kid at the end of season seven, which is honestly... One, the, the, probably the main thing that I think season seven pays off the best in the show is Vit Simmons' relationship, ultimately. Um, because I don't like in season six how, like, they're just separate from each other and all that nonsense, but, um, I do like the idea. I really love the idea of how, like, the universe wants them apart. And I think that's a really unique idea that they chose to go with, especially because with all the stuff with the, with Mabeth in season three, and and um, it, they they just get really really deep into that idea, um, and especially in season uh in the framework when um like Fitz is the doctor, he's doing all these evil things, but like he's stuck to. Madame Hydra, but she, I guess in this case it's Ada, um, or Ophelia, or she calls her Ophelia, which is a dumb name, but anyway, um, regardless of that, um, just the way, like, the amount of depth is honestly within this character is incredible. Um, because Fitz, um, like, he starts out as a scientist guy, you know, he's kind of nervous, um, pretty soft-spoken, and then, like, as seasons two and three progress, he really gains a lot more of a personality, um, and, and, um, like, what he's passionate about and how much he needs Simmons' presence around, and I love, especially in season two, at the beginning of season two, that's one of the best things about season two, to me, is Fitz's mental arc, because basically, at the end of season one, War betrays Fitzsimmons, but he doesn't kill them like Garrett told him to, he just dumps them in the ocean, in the queue, knowing that they can get out, and then Fitz drown, nearly drowns, has severe mental damage, and... Like, he can barely function, he's always stirring on his words, and I really love how they develop that in Fitz's character throughout the show, and I think that's one of the much better, um, 
aspects of his character the way that they did that. Um, Simmons also kind of the same boat. They start as friends, but then um, you know they obviously grow feelings for each other and whatnot. And then like the stuff in the framework is really really good because there's this constant battle with Simmons to try and um. Uh, because she knows that Fitz loves her, and she's trying to prove that to this framework version of himself. And I think that that's personally some extremely profound, like, dialogue that happens between them. And then also the mob stuff, and then Will, it, that, like, 4,000... Uh, 722 hours is one of my favorite episodes in the whole series, not just season 3, but the entire show. Um, just because, well, for one, the way that they track the time, and it's just exclusively about Simmons and eventually Will, and how they find each other, and how they have to head back, and how they almost lose his Will, and whatever. And just the way that they count it off like that, and like as the hours gradually go by, I I honestly think it's one of the best structured episodes as well. Um, and again, ultimately they end up getting married and they end up having a kid, and just their relationship pays off in such a satisfying way because. They take, like, every, you know, classic trope of, like, you know, friends, boyfriend, girlfriend, married, having a kid, and they do it so, 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 so well. Um, um, I could go on and talk about the next. I'll talk about Mac and Yo-Yo next. So, I guess starting with Yo-Yo, because there's less of the power. So, Yo-Yo is introduced in Season 2, and, or not Season 2, Season 3, as a really unique and hidden human, because she kind of leaves her power were given by God, or, or what, or whatever. Um, and, um, it's, uh, really interesting to me, um, how they incorporate her powers because especially because because like it's the whole thing in season six where she gets like this because in season six is a thing where the shrike which is this deadly back thing if it gets in you it kills you and then like she somehow manages to live out the shrikes and whatnot and then it's this whole thing where like um in season seven, it actually ends up unlocking her full potential, which I think was a really interesting idea that they had regarding Yo-Yo Speak, because originally she's just like, um, and this is a big part of her character too, like, but powers is just like, she zip, she still has super speed, but it's like, zips to one place and then goes back, and she, and she constantly comments on this, of how it's a good thing and a bad thing, but like, that idea of like, run away and then always come back, to the same spot. This kind of recurring theme of her character throughout the show, just like the war with the closure, I love that they kept to these consistent things throughout the show. Um, uh, and I love um, watching Mac and Yo-Yo's relationship develop, even though I was kind of disappointed they didn't go in as many directions as I would have liked it to. Um, uh, um, but anyway, the thing with the Shrike is, it, it actually ends up walking the fact that she has actual, like, full on uh, super speed. Um, which I think was a really, really interesting idea that they chose to go with there. Um, because, um, yeah, um, yeah, just because, um, honestly of the, um, just, I, I love the idea of a character unlocking their true potential, like, that idea always really, really appeals to me, um, and, uh, I honestly, um, 
really, really do like, um, yeah. <laughs> I like Yo-Yo's character. Moving on to Mac, um, Mac isn't really that interesting of a character, to be completely honest. Most of the time, he's just given badass action scenes. Um, though, um, there, which, speaking of badass action scenes, um, something I really like about Mac's character is, or Mac's action scenes is the shotgun axe idea, because, um, it has so many awesome moments throughout the show, and, um, and he just br he casually brings it up in season two, like maybe a shotgun axe combination of some sort, and like that this just pays off in such an excellent way. Um, um and I'm honestly I'm going to talk about only the main characters here because I want to talk about every single character in this. Um, in these like. I mean, this would, this would be the actual list, but then just a review of Agents of Sheep, which would take forever, because there's so much to talk about with characters in this show. Um, when you're talking about, um, there are other good things about this character, too. Like, I really like the way that, um, the relationship between him and Daisy developed, because it's kind of like a, um, brother-sister relationship, which I think is a really unique perspective to tackle, um, even if it's only really present in Season 3. Um, I still really like that. Another thing about Mac that I've already mentioned about Fitz is, in Season 2, he kind of becomes a friendly figure who helps Mac who helps fits a lot through. That's another thing I, I like about Mac's character. And I think the best thing about Mac's character is really in um, seasons like five, six, seven, and kind of gradually showing throughout all, all, all of the previous season series his talent as director when like Colson has, has to be awesome. Where else he, he almost always names Mac the director or like. Um, he names Daisy the director, who is really not fit to be one, by the way. Um, and, uh, then you're just talking about, like, um, how, uh, Daisy appoints Mac director, and then in season six and seven, it's really interesting because you see him trying to live up to Colson's example. Which I think was a really interesting character approach for them to take with Mac's character that I really thoroughly approve of. <sighs> On, um, I honestly think that um, May is... One of the most intriguing characters in the show, um, primarily because, um, um, just like, for one, how much is hidden about her, and, um, and, like, this event of Bahrain, Bahrain, I think it's how Bahrain is like gradually um il like um alluded to or alluded to that's the word alluded to um throughout the season one and two until eventually you finally get this episode about it and like there's so many different perspectives about why she's called the cavalry and what happened in Bahrain that made her so standoffish and different. Um, and eventually she discovers more of a personality, especially in season three when Andrew Garter is introduced, or season two and season three, which I will talk about him because he is another one of my favorite characters. Um, uh, I really like, um, like the way that they just develop May's character in terms of, like, the way uh, that she, um, her relationship to Andrew, I think, was really, really well developed, especially in season three. Um, but again, I'll, I'll get to more on that later. But um, 
I also think in later seasons that, um, she's just kind of a solid character, and she definitely has the best action scenes in the whole, like, series, for sure. Um, so yeah, May's a character that I can say many, many positive things about. Um, moving on to Lincoln. Uh, Lincoln, I think, is has a nice relationship with Daisy, but the main thing I like about Lincoln is his self-control issues and how he's trying to be a S.H.I.E.L.D. agent, and then he can't really live up to the standards, um, and, he's, and he's constantly trying, which I really, really love about it. Um, and, um, also just the way that, um, they pay off, uh, like his sacrifice is, is one of the best moments in season three and maybe the entire show. I can't say the entire show definitely because there's so many good moments. I say maybe in season three because there's a lot of incredible moments in season three. And there's just this great payoff with Hive. And it's ultimately at the end of season three with Hive and then Lincoln. It's the ultimate payoff to the whole inhuman arc idea. Until it's explored further, further by the Kree in season five. Um, which, by the way, Kasaias is an idiot. I don't like him. <laughs> um, um, another character that I wanted to very quickly touch on is probably my favorite character, and that's um, Mike Peterson. Um, his main character development just comes in season one, mostly, because you really see him just just wanting to protect his son and protect the city with his superpowers, but, like, the centipede serum makes him really, really angry, and, like, he nearly explodes in season one alone, or episode one alone, by the way, because it sets up that whole thing, and in only season one, episode one, they have this whole thing about Mike Peterson, like, wanting to explode and nearly exploding and all that great stuff and eventually he's brought on as this additional team member and you get some really interesting like wrench dynamics and him, try, and him trying to prove to Coulson that he has a second chance um and then of course you really see how much he cares for his son and then how like he doesn't like what he's doing for the deathlock thing but he's being controlled and then, like, that only payoff when he's like, what are we, a team, like, through Ace and whatever. Um, that's, like, the best Mike Peterson moment besides Season 5. He appears as, like, one of Coulson's, like, um, fears that, that comes out, of, like, his fear of dying manifests pretty much out of the whole gaping whole thing. Um... Which I really think is cool. Um, uh, moving on to easily another one of my favorite characters is Dr. Garner slash Lash. Slash Lash. <laughs> anyway, like, and Lash. Um... So, starting with the Season 2 thing, I think that he's a great character because of the way that he manages to calm down, uh, I guess known as Sky at the time, and she's just a really great character, I, I, I'm gonna do Daisy last, by the way, um, because she's definitely the most, there's the character with the most to talk about, um, for sure. Um... But, um, I think she does a great job as the counseling role in season two, honestly, and I think he does a very good job of that. So, um, also the way that they managed to kind of, um, develop his character so that, um, like, like, you really see these two sides to him and like and like when you're rewatching the show you notice that the ingenious subtleties like 
the like how early they they hint at Garner being Lash, you you can't even tell until you've rewatched the show like three times. Because the the dialogue is so subtle and it's absolutely ingenious, genuinely. Um and also he has got like great action moments and then, and then just the payoff and like his lack of control is just really, really good character writing, honestly. But moving on to the biggest character or the one to talk about the most is definitely Scott slash Daisy. So starting in seasons one and two, she's kind of this hacker type personality, um, kind of recluse that slowly makes friends with Colson and the rest of the team. Um And I, I and I really, really do like what they did um with um how how they handled her um transformation into an inhuman in um this um uh, uh episode or whatever. Um so like, I really really do like that aspect of her character and um talking about her powers like I feel like um they kind of um I feel like the way that they handled her powers is like with the, just the thing that's kind of lame and like they and like they they have gradual hints to her powers like as the show goes on like with her being able to lift things up and then carry people down and then like um move things to the ground and whatever and I think there was a lot of wasted potential in um Daisy's powers because of just the thing um I do really think it's interesting in season five when she has her power removed and like she wants and she has the power removed by the doctor and bits and whatever and fits this whole really also really interesting multi personality thing um but um just the way that they managed to make um I don't know her seem like such a um yeah I'm so bad at describing these <sighs> Um, there's just little snippets of potential in, like, when I'm thinking of that, like, um, um, Nathaniel Malick in the seventh season, who's the main, uh, villain of that, by the way, he is, like, the, he is what I see in the potential there, because he, he's using, like, these quick infused punches and kicks and whatever, and ultimately the fight between Daisy and... Nathaniel Malick in the seventh season is the best kind of like paid off uh, fight mechanic in the whole show because like it's the ultimate payoff of like every single stupid potential that the earthquake powers have had throughout the entire show and I really thoroughly love that. Um, obviously I talked about the relationship with Coulson, really, really good, along with her relationship to pretty much every other character, and in particular Mac, the brother-sister thing I kind of about with Mac's character, um, I also like how her and Lincoln's relationship develop, and, um, yeah, that's really all I can think of to talk about <laughs> characters. I want to touch on one more thing really quickly, and that is the structure of the show. So, you may remember from my Queen's Gambit review, if you saw that video, that I mentioned that the structure of the Queen's Gambit is kind of like this mini-series structure, where it has less episodes, but, but like, they're longer. And... Um, Agent of S.H.I.E.L.D., I really feel like, is the ultimate mix of both styles of TV show, because it's seven seasons, which is a, which is a substantial amount of seasons, like, when compared to any average TV show, obviously, there's longer, there's much longer ones, but, yeah, um, 
and even five seasons, it's still applicable the same way. Even if six, season six and seven have a lot less episodes, um, they're still really good. Because seasons one through five consistently had 22 episodes. And season six had 12, and season seven had 13, I believe. I'm going to be getting the numbers switched around there. But um, each episode, you might think it's like 20. No, they're 40 to 45 minute episodes. And I absolutely love that, which I guess it was like an hour on TV with all the commercials and stuff like that, but on Netflix, just, um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I also, yeah, this is like the ultimately structured show, in my opinion, because it's got long episodes, a lot of episodes per season, and a good amount of seasons. Which it means it gives you, like, so much to watch. And I absolutely love that. So, that is, in conclusion, why Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. is my favorite show. And, wow, I'm, I'm very glad that I did not do one whole video. Because this recording is already 46 minutes. So, yeah, I'm going to stop it here. Um, if you watch all the way through these two really, really long videos, then... You have my sincerest thanks. Um, thanks for watching and see you later.